we found out that after Jamal went inside, 15 men came in on two different airplanes, charter planes, in the, in the consulate at the same time. We found out that one of those planes left an hour after it landed. We found out that all 15 of those people had disappeared and it seems that they brought with them what's called a bone saw, a saw to cut up somebody's body. We know he went into the consulate and we know that he never came out as far as anybody can tell. And the other thing that we found out is that they took the cameras and the video footage away. So we're gonna start out doing some talking uh, to show what Jamal was all about by reading some of his writings. And you can start us out, Carolyn. On September 18, 2017, Khashoggi wrote for the Washington Post, when I speak of the fear, intimidation, arrest, and public shaming of intellectuals and religious leaders who dare to speak their minds, and then I tell you that I'm from Saudi Arabia, are you surprised? Uh, they are, surely, and I understand there is some frustration within the U.S. administration about the Saudi response so far. The diplomatic reform. pressure is certainly intensifying uh, for answers. Uh, as for the politicians, they are more tempted at the moment. Uh, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, has called for the Saudis to support Such a full investigation and to be transparent but about all the findings. I see now is the Vice the President, Mike Pompeo, has suggested the FBI to assist the uh, but there's still a way to go before the Crown politicians Prince's ramp up that to pressure. The uh, meanwhile, the there are protests are good like this of mine, friends and, and uh, the colleagues and supporters the of Khashoggi. Earlier I spoke to a very close friend of him, his, who'd known him for 25 years. He told me how apprehensive he'd be going into that concert. It was painful for me several years ago when several friends were arrested. I said nothing. I didn't want to lose my job or my freedom. I worried about you give me my a few, family. Yeah. I have made a different choice now. Yeah, I have left my home, my family, and my job, and I am raising my voice. To do otherwise would betray those who languish in prison. I can speak when so many cannot. I want you to know that Saudi Arabia has not always been as it is now. Saudis deserve better. That was Nihad Awad, a friend of Khashoggi, speaking to me earlier. And uh, friends and former colleagues of Khashoggi say they're Ben's determined Muhammad to keep the right pressure up. They don't want this to fall off the news agenda, uh, as you can expect Dozens more protests like this over coming Clarence, journalists, and social media stars have been arrested in the past two months, the majority of whom, at worst, are mildly critical of the government. Meanwhile, many members of the Council of well, potentially ideas. it could, yes, because Shape the U.S. Al has Al thrown its backing behind Saudi Arabia. It's the main plank of Donald Trump's policy TV in the Middle East. The uh, he sees the Saudis as a bulwark Shape against Saba Iran. You may remember Biden his very first trip was to Saudi Arabia, his first foreign trip as president, uh, in which he agreed a $110 billion dollar arms deal. And there is a fear that maybe the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, who pulls the strings there, thought that he could get away with this because the American criticism of Saudi behavior elsewhere has been so muted in Yemen, for example. Uh, did the crown prince uh, miscalculate what will the U.S. response to be? Bear in mind that when Russia was accused of poisoning a former spy in the United Kingdom, the U.S. expelled 60 Russian diplomats. Uh, will there be a similar response towards Saudi Arabia if it's found, uh, if these allegations are found to be true? Saudi Arabia's crown prince is acting like Putin, November 5th, 2017. Corruption in Saudi Arabia is quite different from corruption in most other countries, as it is not limited to a bribe in return for a contract or expensive gift to the family member of a government official or prince, or use of a private jet that is charged to the government so a family can go on vacation. 
Instead, in Saudi Arabia, senior officials and princes become billionaires as contracts are either enormously inflated or at worst, a complete mirage. In 2004, Lawrence Wright wrote in the New Yorker about the Kingdom of Silence, where a massive sewer project in Jeddah was really a series of mint hole covers across the city with no actual pipes underneath. The editor of a major newspaper at the time can say that we all knew and we never reported on it. The Saudi ambassador from the United States, who operates in this building behind me, uh, he has said that he had no knowledge of what happened to the journalist after he left the consulate. So for those of you just tuning in now, we're live outside of the Saudi Arabia Embassy in D.C. Um, to, to hold the Saudis accountable for uh, Khashoggi's disappearance and murder. Saudi Arabia is paying the price for betraying the Arab Spring. The choice of waging even more war is tempting for those in Riyadh who want an overwhelming defeat for the Houthis and to get them out of the political game. But it will be very costly, not only for the kingdom, but for the Yemeni people who are already suffering immensely. This conflict is the horrific result of preventing the people of Yemen from achieving their desire for freedom. Now the Houthi has become a significant force and they do not hold the values of the Arab Spring based on power sharing. The world is watching Yemen. Not only should the Saudis stop the war, but there should be pressure for, for the Iranians to stop their support for the Houthis. Both sides must accept a Yemeni formula to share power. Perhaps the fall of Salah, the tyrant, is a chance for peace in Yemen. Oh. Now, there may not be many people here lunchtime on a Wednesday in the center of Why Saudi Arabia's crown prince should visit Detroit. Watching, and this is exactly what the organizers here many inner cities in Saudi Arabia fester today as Detroit once did. They are miserable third world slums that completely mock the oil riches of the kingdom. So, before MBS ventures into building new cities, perhaps we should deal with the old ones. And in April of this year, entitled By Blaming 1979 for Saudi Arabia's Problem, the Crown Prince is peddling revisionist history. In Saudi Arabia at the moment, people simply don't care to speak. The country has seen the blacklisting of those who dare raise their voices, the imprisonment of moderately critical intellectuals and religious figures, and the alleged anti-corruption crackdown on royals and other business leaders. Liberals whose work was once censored or banned by Wahhabi hardliners have turned the tables. They now ban what they see as hard lines, such as the censorship of various books at the Riyadh International Book Fair last month. One may applaud such an about face, but shouldn't we aspire to allow the marketplace of ideas to be open? Jamal Khashoggi wrote on June 25th, 2018. Saudi Arabia's women can finally drive, but the crown prince to do, needs to do much, much more. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman deserves considered credit for bringing the matter to a close in the right way. While previous leaders were reluctant to take up the issue, he faced it head on and did the right thing for Saudi Arabia. At the same time, 
I hope he will not forget the brave actions of each and every Saudi who individually worked hard for freedom and modernization. He should order the release of Hafnu, Aziza al Yosef, Iman al Nafshan, and the other brave women who campaigned for women's right to drive. They should be allowed to finally witness the results of their tears and toil. This is from Saudi Arabia's reformers now face a terrible choice, and the date is May 21st, 2018. It is appalling to see 60 and 70 year old icons of reform being branded as traitors on the front pages of Saudi newspapers. Women and men who champion many of the same social freedoms, including women driving, that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is now advancing, were arrested in Saudi Arabia last week. The crackdown has shocked even the government's most stalwart defenders. The arrests illuminate the predicament confronting all Saudis. We are being asked to abandon any hope of political freedom and to keep quiet about arrests and travel bans that impact not only the critics, but also their families. We are expected to vigorously applaud social reforms and keep praise on the Crown Prince while avoiding any reference to the pioneering Saudis who dared to address these issues decades ago. The message is clear to all. Activism of any sort has to be within the government and no independent voice or counter opinion will be allowed. Everyone must stick to the party line. Is there no other way for us? Must we choose between movie theater and our rights as citizens to speak out? whether in support of or critical of our government's actions? Do we only voice glowing references to our leader's decisions, his vision of our future, in exchange for the right to live and travel freely for ourselves and our wives, husbands and children too? I have been told that I need to accept with gratitude the social reforms that I have long called for while keeping silent on other matters, ranging from the Yemen quadfire, hastily executed economic reforms, the blockade of Qatar, discussions about an alliance with Israel to counter Iran, and last year's imprisonment of dozens of Saudi intellectuals and clerics. This is the choice I've woken up to each morning ever since last June, when I left Saudi Arabia for the last time after being silenced by the government for six months.
It is our weapons sold to them that killed massively children and people throughout Yemen. Lightning is not considered sacred. So Jamal spoke the truth, evidently. Our journalists are so important today. Our journalists speaking truth are so important, and so is Jamal. So when the President of the United States was asked, have you called the Prince with whom you were present here just a few months ago? No, he said, but I'll be doing so. Well, that will be the story for our journalists. And so will he speak of criminal actions? Will he speak of kidnapping and murder? Will he ask to be present to Jamal to confirm that he is still living? These are the important questions of these times. We need a partnership, a relationship that is positive and is good, that does not allow blood to be on our hands. We in the United States do not want any complicity in the kind of destruction that is going on in that region of the country. So today we gather to speak another truth. And it is a blessing for the journalists here to know this very important story. So as you speak truth to this power, to the power of this country and the power of Saudi Arabia, thank you. We are grateful. So for those watching, we have a ton of press My name here, is Samia Harris, and I'm simply which is great to see activist. that attention has been given and, uh, to this I'm issue. And I think it's a large part because Shaggy was a member of the press. He was a journalist for the, the Washington Post. So I think a lot of media is recognizing the absolute atrocity uh, that this is, the, this crackdown on journalists, on activists, on anyone who speaks out against Saudi Arabia has become tremendously problematic. I mean, it's always been problematic, but this continuous crackdown is just showing how extreme this regime continues to be. Uh, and the U.S. remains an, an ally of Saudi Arabia, and we need to speak out and condemn that and demand that our State Department speak out against Saudi Arabia's actions, especially in light of what has happened to Khashoggi. Because we oppose the system. This is our right. This is the Constitution right. This is the Bill of Rights. This is the human rights. The human rights is global. It does not depend on how we feel about the country and what is the financial benefit with the country. So I am asking our president, Mr. Trump, I am asking him to take a stand on our behalf on all the human rights activists, on all the citizens of America, that we will take a stand, not only against the Saudi system, should it be proven that they have committed a crime. Journalism is not a crime. Speaking freely is not a crime. Fighting for a better life for their own country is not a crime. So I am asking Mr. President that passing or giving a pass to all these rulers, not just the Saudi ruler, but Sisi, who has in his jail 60,000 activists, 60,000 people who are basically opposing the system for no reason and no try, no respect for the rule of law. People have been kidnapped, have disappeared, have been killed, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in Egypt and in other countries. We cannot give a pass to these people, Mr. President. You cannot sit with them and shake your hands and pretend that everything is just 
fine and dandy because we have a relationship or a financial benefit with these countries. America is only great when we protect everything that we are built on. We are built on respect for the rule of law. Respect for the rule of law doesn't stop with our borders in America. It, kept, it keeps going in the whole wide world. America is great only when we protect the founding principles we have been built on. The founding principles that allows for a party of Democrats, Independents, and the Republic. And we all fight politically, but yet we respect each other's rights, each other's human rights. So I'm asking Mr. President and the whole government, on behalf of us being American citizens, that we take the real stand to keep America great for real. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Ali Al Ahmed. Uh, and I am also a dissident. In fact, I am the longest, longest active dissident against the Saudi monarchy in the United States. So I can relate uh, to this uh, uh, disappearance and kidnapping uh, and maybe murder of, of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, number one, because I'm a dissident, I have been a target of the same machine, the terror machine of the Saudi government and the monarchy and because I'm also a journalist and a writer and who have been targeted with similar attempts since I came to Washington 18 years ago and started writing and gathering and organizing events to shed lights and my country across the board when it comes to violations of human rights, of funding terrorism across the region, across the world, of the brutal uh, nature of the Saudi monarchy and its corruption and the suffocation of the freedoms, basic freedoms of our people, I have been targeted. Several times the Saudi agents tried to take me outside the United States on uh, using other people, just like what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. He was brought outside the United States and, and kidnapped and maybe killed. I was offered lots of money by members of the ruling family and this embassy, I have documents, you will see it in the, in, in, the, in the press, official Saudi documents, hey, can I still roll on that this embassy was spying in the United States on me and other activists. So this embassy should be closed. You know when Russia, was accused of doing what it did, what happened? And the United States, they shut down and expelled diplomats. Well, this is the time, because this is not the first time this embassy is involved in targeting dissidents. They have targeted me, and I have the proof. And they are most likely involved in the targeting, the kidnapping, of Jamal Khashoggi. We, we are now, we're told now, we'll check that, that they, he was told when he came here to finish that paperwork that he needs to go to Turkey to do that paperwork. So they set him up. So they're involved. And that's why I would be asking the U.S. administration officially to expel the Saudi ambassador from the United States. This Saudi ambassador is the younger brother of MBS, the mastermind of this crime. Mohammed bin Salman is the mad king of Saudi Arabia. And Jamal Khashoggi is not his first or last victim. We have experienced over the years what the Saudi monarchy does to us. They have put my brothers and nephews and other members of my family in jail for years under torture. And Jamal Khashoggi, his brothers couldn't talk to him because they're afraid. His own son didn't talk to him because he was afraid from being punished. So this government, and Jamal Khashoggi is not the dissident like me. He is 
a mild guy. He's he's loyal to the regime. In fact, he supports the monarchy, but he criticizes the mad kid MBS. So, and he, that's why he is a but he is a bigger target for them because they don't want defections. And maybe somebody, I call on those people inside the embassy who have some sense and some conscience to defect. I want to see some diplomats to defect. Please tell them, encourage them to defect. We want some defections from the Saudi embassy in Washington and other embassies. This embassy took away my passport in 2004 when I tried to renew it. And they refused to give my son a two-year-old, two-month-old son, papers to say that he, this is his country. And then later they decided to just take away his citizenship and they took my citizenship. So I really know and understand and experience this type of mentality of the Saudi monarchy. I know some of you here in this audience, last year you supported the Saudi monarchy. You defended them, even against me. But now you see, you were wrong. It's never right to support a dictator, no matter where he's from, no matter what language he speaks, his color, whatever religion or ideology he belongs to. It's wrong always to support an oppressor. Oppression does not know limits. So that's why we must, we must condemn this crime, no matter who the victim is, no matter who the perpetrator is. And now we know the true nature of MBS. Last year, when he kidnapped and forced the elected Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad al-Hariri, he held an elected, this never happened by the way, maybe the, the only time I remember when George Bush arrested him, so he was not elected. But this is elected, Saad al-Hariri is an elected, you like him or hate him, he's an elected head of, of, of the Lebanese government, and MBS took him hostage. And what did the United States, the UK, and other countries do? Nothing. He should not have been welcomed into the United States. So among the things we're asking for is this. Expel this ambassador and other, and other secret service agents in the embassy. We know them. We will give their name to the, to the Americans. They know them actually, so I don't have to give it to you. you know, they, we, we, they want them out from this. When we want the guarantee, and we want the US government to investigate the role of the Saudi embassy in the kidnapping of Jamal Khashoggi, and spying and surveillance of his activity and actions. And also we want the hearing in Congress. Okay, the Kavanaugh hearing is over. We need, we need a hearing. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need some sanctions against the ruling family. And we want a ban on the entry of Mohammed bin Salman, the bad king of Saudi Arabia, from the United States. He is not welcome here. And we want also to investigate those officials and not an official, past or present, who took money from the Saudis to to let to look the other way, to help them. Because if you help the Saudi government against anyone, you're part of that crime. And there are Jamal Khashoggi or Ali Al Ahmed or whomever. So the apologists, the Thomas Friedmans of America should be held accountable. The New York Times, if, if they have any respect for journalism, they should let this guy go. He's nothing but an opportunist. And he has not apologized for his role in whitewashing the criminal mindset of the mad king of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. I want to say that to the Saudi monarchy, to the Mohammed bin Salman, and to his father and his brother here, that we are not afraid. We did not stand up for the rights of our people because we're cowards. We know the price that we will pay or we may have to pay. I have two cousins of mine who died in protest. I was shot at at 12 years old. I know it, I come from the bottom of this, I know, I've experienced it. At 14 I was a political prisoner with my parents and my brothers. And we know this, this is not unique. Jamal Khashoggi's condition is not unique, ladies and gentlemen. At this 
Islam, we have the highest, the worst environment of fear and persecution in the entire country history under this mad king. And that's why we must forget our differences and focus on this guy, this criminal Muhammad bin Salman. We need to see an end to, to this absolute monarchy. You cannot have human rights and justice with an absolute government. It's impossible. Okay? You cannot have it. So we need to change the systems. And that's why we need support, even with words, with social media, anything you can, because it's important. The, at this age and time, the human beings have developed so much, have evolved so much. We should not accept a government by the one, by the few, by the, by the elite. Government should be of the people, for the people, for all the people, and responsible for the people, and serve the people. And right now we don't have that in my country. And my life cause is to promote and help build a government truly by the people, for the people. I know the price is high. I have suffered. I am a stateless person. And I tell you something. Even the US government has, have supported the Saudis. Why do you think somebody like me, who has been a legal resident since 1989, doesn't have a citizenship yet? It took me 11 years and lawsuits to get a green card. I was banned from leaving the United States illegally, so I would not do work and hold conferences and raise money for our work to promote an alternative to the Saudi monarchy. Because there are people here, bigots within the U.S. government, who do not want to see brown people like me rule their own country and control their own resources. So now we want to support. This is an American time for the American people to shine, to show this country is a great part of this country, a country that was supposed to be built by the people, for the people, who that overthrow a monarchy. Go to the whole new document in the National Archive and Constitution. You'll see those documents. Same thing we want to do. Like you remove absolute monarchy from the United States of America, that's what we want. We deserve it. We are people who want love, peace, prosperity, and freedom for all. So again, I call you on you to support us in this effort to protect journalists and everybody in my country from the oppression, from the brutality of Mohammed bin Salman. And we need your support so we can convince Congress and the administration to take real steps, like expelling Saudi uh, ambassador, the younger brother of the criminal mindset, the criminal mad kid in Saudi Arabia, Muhammad bin Salman, who is responsible for this crime. Two of his bodyguards are part of that hit team, kill team, kidnap team, whatever, who went to Turkey. And we have their pictures, their names, so we are certain this is Mohammed bin Salman's doing and he's responsible. So we need to hold him responsible and not only him, but those who whitewash his, his crime in the United States. There is no time to waste because if you let your neighbor uh, die or kill or be killed, you're next. So as we say in Arabic, if your neighbor's beard has been shaven, you, you better watch your own beard because you'll be shaven next. So I tell you, I think we have an opportunity here to bring uh, uh, pressure to make difference in my country so my people can be free, so my brothers and cousins and thousands of friends and, and colleagues in the country who are being oppressed or not allowed to travel, who are living under fear under, under the leadership of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. We want to end this nightmare and we need the support because it's good for you too. The more freedom around the world there is, the more freedom you will have here. Thank you and I apologize for taking a little bit more than I should. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Our, our next speaker is the director of the Council on American Islamic Relations Care. Saudi Arabia. The question being asked, what happened to Washington Post My name is Nihad Awad. N I H A D A W A D. This is a sad day for me to come and stand 
front of an embassy that I used to go inside to build the relations. To build the relations to improve the relations between Saudi Arabia and the US. Not exclusively to this embassy, but many embassies in the hope that my advocacy, my work, will help improve the relations. This is my first time I stand outside the embassy to protest what's being reported about the potential action and involvement of the Saudi mission in the disappearance, kidnapping, and potential murder and potential dismemberment of my friend of 25 years, Jamal Hashim. I am here as a friend. This man I have known for over two decades became a close associate of mine. I admire his work, his courage, his critical thinking, and his ability to analyze issues and to be a journalist recognized around the world. Jamal Khashoggi is unique because he worked as a professional journalist. He headed two newspapers. He was the director of a TV station that did not last more than a few days. And he worked for the government that he loves because he wanted to give the best of his talent and expertise to help his people and his government. But when it became so hard for him to operate as a journalist, as a citizen, as a free thinker, and he saw the mounting oppression and pressure on free speech, when he saw the imprisonment of scholars, of reformers, of human rights activists, when he saw that someone who make a prayer for peace between two countries has been taken to jail, when he saw that the, the, the brother of a scholar who was taken to jail, when this brother affirmed and confirmed to the media that his brother was jailed, they jailed his brother as well. So it became so difficult, so impossible for him to live as a citizen and to write and speak. He was forced not to tweet, not to write, and not to be a journalist for six months. If you know Jamal Khashoggi, Jamal Khashoggi cannot live as a human being without writing, without being who's he, a journalist. He was so fortunate to travel and leave while many of his friends have been under travel ban. They prevented many of their families of traveling, they froze many of their assets to make it impossible for them to leave. Jamal Khashoggi ended up in the US where he received education and he stayed in his condo in Virginia. That's where I used to visit him and close by restaurant we had so many lunches and so many dinners. Jamal Khashoggi did not have his family with him. I and many friends became his family because he needed social support. His family is under pressure. And what you see in terms of what's being said on, his, on their behalf, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Jamal Khashoggi's condition are unknown. He was seeking protection in the United States on December 31st. I received a text message that he was so happy and so joyful that he received approval for his asylum protection. Then he became literally under the US protection and his application was expedited because he is a unique talent. And they recognized him for who he is. The Washington Post asked him to write for them and he 
Sears who became a frequent columnist because of his vast experience and talent in helping all, all of us understand what's going on in the region. Now, last Tuesday, I received a call from one of his close friends that his fiance told us that she's been waiting outside the consulate in Istanbul and he did not come out. I called Jamal, he did not answer the phone. I texted him and he did not answer. And then I started to feel that something is really wrong. Oh, and he was at the press conference. I had my sleepless nights yeah, I didn't get there. You know because I was working with Jamal and Jamal would call me and tell me everything that happens with him. Ever since the nightmare started, you all, you know the details. What you don't know about Jamal is, Jamal is a loving person. He never wanted to be a dissident. He never saw himself as a, a political figure. He loves journalism and he wants to write. That's all he cares about. And being a journalist is not a crime. Journalism is not a crime. Writing is not a crime. And speaking out is not a crime. Speaking truth to power should be protected, should be promoted. And yes, it is part of our faith as Muslims. It's part of our faith to speak truth to power, even if that endangers your safety. There is a known saying about the Prophet saying that some of the best people in paradise are the people who defend themselves, but also those who stand up and say truth to power and they get killed. I hope and pray that Jamal Khajuji did not see his fate as a martyr. I'm still hopeful that he's alive, but from what we have seen so far, Unfortunately, the picture is becoming dimmer and dimmer. He went inside the consulate, he never came out. The Saudi mission has the ultimate responsibility to clear evidence that he's alive and he left. Until now, they did not. The 15 people who flew in and flew out in the same day to carry some business inside the mission has to be investigated. The invasion of a sovereign nation like Turkey is something that cannot be tolerated. The attack on freedom of expression should not be tolerated. And my call on our president, President Trump, although I did not vote for him, is he has the ultimate responsibility for the safety of Jamal Khashoggi because Jamal Khashoggi is a resident of Virginia and he deserves protection. I am so dismayed and concerned that the U.S. agencies intercepted a communication between Saudi officials who allegedly were plotting to capture Jamal and the U.S. government did not warn Jamal. The U.S. government is held responsible for his safety and I demand my government to answer this question what did you do with that information? Why didn't you warn Jamal Khashoggi about the, in the, the danger that he might be captured in a matter of just short time or short days? I'm very concerned about his safety. I ask all of you, journalists, that Jamal is your representative. Jamal speaks for all of you. Jamal is the hero of the media and the press, and we all should not rest until we find answers, sat satisfying answers, and God forbid, if he, if he received his faith that we are fearful for, that we will have to hold those responsible for his death accountable to the highest extent of the law. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Munji Dawadi. I am part of the coordinating uh, group for the newly formed Justice for Jamal campaign. Uh, I would like to thank Code Pink uh, and, and the, its leaders for putting this together. Uh, and thank you for being here. Uh, briefly, I just wanted to uh, highlight.
highlight a couple of points. That when we come here and we protest and we make demands that the Saudi regime uh, tell us exactly what happened to Jamal, and if he's still alive, that they must release him immediately. And if they didn't, then they must be held accountable. Uh, we, when we stand here and make these demands, we are under no illusion that a regime like the regime that is in charge of Saudi Arabia does not respond well to just asks or just protests. This is an authoritarian regime. This is a regime that responds to by killing dissidents, by, by trying to silence those voices that try to be reasonable and make reasonable demands. But we are, this is the course that we set for ourselves, and these are the first steps that we are taking. And we, when we make demands for Saudi Arabia standing here, we also make demands for those who do business with Saudi Arabia. We know that the U.S. does quite a good business and does a lot of arms sales to Saudi Arabia, and we demand that the U.S. must stop these sales. We demand that the U.S. must stop its business as usual. We demand that the policy that is being approached by the U.S. of, of looking the other way and, and, and giving carte blanche to the, those in the region to do whatever it takes just for us to do business as usual is not acceptable anymore. And the campaign for justice for Jamal is just the beginning. And we hope that we can put our hands together with the groups like Paul Pink and others to bring justice not just for Jamal, but people like Jamal who tried to raise their voices. Jamal, for those who, who knew him, you knew a, a gentle soul. Jamal was a gentleman. Jamal was, was a thoughtful person. You could disagree with him on ideas, and, and many of us do sometimes, uh, because he believed that the system could be changed from the inside. Others, we think that the system is so corrupt that it must be changed completely. But you can disagree with him, but there's one thing that when you come to know him, the person, you fall in love with him. He is a great man, he's a great journalist, he's a reasonable voice for the region. And if those who are trying to silence him think that they will be successful in doing that, they're absolutely wrong. Because of Jamal, there's many voices that are going to be raising, many people are going to be organizing. We are not going to let up. We're going to keep the pressure on. We're going to keep the pressure on the Saudi government, we're going to keep the pressure on the U.S. government, we're going to keep the pressure on the partners in the region who try to do and look the other way and do business as usual, but we are not going to bring justice for Jamal no matter what. So uh, thank you again for being here, and I hope that, that this episode at least comes to a positive conclusion and Jamal is released and come back to his friends and family. Thank you.